Hello and greetings, lovely person. This is RPG Mods Fan, and in this video, I will be giving a guided tour of the Dungeons and Dragons module C1 The Hidden Shrine of Tamawachan, which was written by Harold Johnson and Jeff R. Leeson, and was published quite a number of times. The module was meant for player characters between levels 5 to 7. The D&D C1 module was first published by TSR in 1980. TSR then republished it in 1981. These versions of the module were written for AD&D first edition rules, but it was later converted to both fourth and fifth edition rules. Wizards of the Coast republished this module for the D&D 4th edition rules in their December 2012 issue of Dungeon Magazine issue number 209. In 2017, Wizards of the Coast published Tales of the Yawning Portal. Chapter 3 of this book is basically the conversion of this module into 5th edition rules. So this module has received quite a lot of love from its publishers. I personally do not think this is a good module. However, I think there is one factor that made this module loved by player characters who went through it. The module not only included a booklet for the Dungeon Master, but also included an illustration booklet. It was one of the first few modules that included an illustration booklet. This illustration booklet depicts various parts of the Hidden Shrine to be shown to the player characters at the appropriate time, and it made this D&D module come more alive for the player characters. The C1 module is set in the world of Greyhawk. The Hidden Shrine is located somewhere in the tropical jungles of Amadeo in the lands of the Ullman. For those playing in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, Tales of the Yawning Portal suggests two possible locations for the adventure. One is in the jungles of Maztica, the other is in the jungles of Cholt. Tales of the Yawning Portal has also given possible locations in the Dragonlance and the Eberron campaign settings. The C1 module introduces the ancient Ullman Empire to the world of Greyhawk. The people, society, mythology, culture, and civilization of the Ullman are based on the Mesoamerican societies, mythologies, cultures, and civilizations of Earth. Specifically, the Mayan, Aztec, and Toltec civilizations. Many of the rooms are decorated with figures, statues, and murals in the style of these Mesoamerican cultures. The tournament version of this module has the player characters playing one of three characters. Rael, a human male 6th level fighter. Myra, a human female 7th level cleric and Care, a half-elf male, 5th level mage, and 7th level thief. The plot hook is that these characters are fleeing from pursuers in the jungles of Amadeo. Tamoachen was once the capital of an ancient Oman empire. The city is now abandoned, in ruins, and the jungle has overgrown into it. I like the way the Dungeon Magazine introduces the beginning of this module, which I will paraphrase as follows. Lost in a dense, dark, and dank jungle, pursued by hostile natives, the characters race towards an enormous ziggurat pyramid in the distance. They hope to find higher ground and maybe some shelter. But instead, the surface gives away beneath them and they fall into darkness. They land in the lower chambers of an ancient underground labyrinth, 
filled with dangerous tricks and traps, strange creatures, and... Okay, I better stop here because we are getting into spoiler territory. I will now be reviewing and discussing the module itself, and the rest of this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a dungeon master who will be running this module for their players, or are a player who already played through this module and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. The basic plot summary of the C1 module is the player characters explore a stepped pyramid deep in the heart of a tropical jungle. This Mesoamerican style temple is full of puzzles, traps, and devious tricks. Some of these traps include firebombs, cursed items, and trap-springing statues. The shrine was once dedicated to Zadzil Aha, the vampire bat god of the underworld. The one thing I like about this classic D&D module is that in a tabular format it lists all the monsters that can be encountered along with where they are located and some of their basic stats. From the map, it should be more or less obvious that this is a railroad adventure. This is not surprising since this module can trace its origins to 1979 in a tournament play. Most all of the lower level is filled with poisonous gas. Barring magical or otherwise intervention, the player characters have one hour to get through the lower level before succumbing to the gas. Player characters love fireball and lightning bolt spells. However, the shrine is no longer sturdy. Cave-ins and collapses will occur from the use of such spells. I will now give a guided tour of the module. I think the best way to do so is by using the illustration booklet as a guide. Towards the end of this video, while the end song is playing, I will display the art and drawings along with their applicable locations that I have skipped or not discussed during the main body of this video. The lower chamber the player characters fall into has figurines on opposite sides of the chamber. These figurines will animate if disturbed. The first thing the player characters will encounter is a giant hermit crab whose shell resembles a boulder and a giant crayfish. Ten triangular shaped pillars surround a huge rectangular shaped sarcophagus in the middle of this burial chamber, also known as a sepulchre. On the opposite side of the entrance is a battle axe that is embedded in the wall. The axe casts an ominous shadow of what appears to be a withered arm. In all editions, the axe is a plus two weapon. However, in the original edition, this axe is a cursed and is minus two versus chaotic evil creatures. If the wielder tries to get rid of or throw away the axe, the axe will teleport back to the wielder's hand. Other than the minus two versus chaotic evil creatures, to me, this is a great weapon to have. It can be used both as a melee and a ranged weapon. 5th edition D&D rules does not like using negative numbers in its math. So, in the Tales of the Yawning Portal, the axe's negative 2 stat and teleport capabilities have been removed. I like how the 5th edition rules have simplified the math of the D&D game. However, getting rid of negative numbers goes too far, in my opinion. As FYI, as a house rule, I allow weapons, armor, gear, etc. to be cursed and have negative stats. Sorry for the rant. Just call me a grognard.
Within the sarcophagus lies a vampire, a servant of the shadow-loving Zadzil Aha. He is the axe's current wielder. If the sarcophagus is opened, he will appear as a decaying corpse with a jade mask, a jade pendant, and other jewelry made of precious gems and stones. If the jade mask and pendant are removed, the vampire will awaken and begin regenerating. He will regenerate to full strength within four rounds, unless the player characters manage to put the jade mask and pendant back on him. Along the wall of this passage stands a three and a half meter or twelve foot tall stone statue of a man outfitted in native finery and holding a narrow stone tray in his raised arms. Behind the statue is a hidden passage. As the player characters approach the circled chamber, they will hear a sweet female voice singing. The chamber resembles a sandy beach. Splashing in the water is a nayrid. The best way I can think of to describe nayrids is that they are golden-haired, pale-skinned nymphs made of water. According to Dungeon Magazine and the Yawning Portal book, the name of this nayrid is Dasa Zoltz. Dasa's pet is an electric eel. Here we have a 6 meter or 20 foot wide hallway with piles of rubble and debris scattered along its length. These walls are covered with frescoes. Halfway down the hall is an archway carved with twining serpents. This corridor is a high ceilinged and decorated with four sculptures of animal heads mounted on the walls. The animal heads are that of a coyote, a grinning bear, a bison, and an eagle. In the eagle's mouth, which is trapped, is a bracelet of rock magic. In the original version of the module, the bracelet has three charges that allows the wearer to cast flesh to stone. In the Tales from the Yawning Portal version, the attuned wearer also gains immunity to petrification. Likewise, as a DM, I would also add the ability to cast stone to flesh. There are 15 withered corpses set upright on a ledge two feet above the floor on either wall of this passage. Surprise, surprise! These withered corpses are actually zombies. At the end of this corridor is a small alcove holding a stone pedestal on which rests a small silver coffer. This corridor is basically a mousetrap, where the silver coffer is the bait. In the middle of this octagonal chamber are two stone divans, each with a dust-covered human figure stretched out upon it, a middle-aged man and woman. A crystal flask and two crystal goblets are on a low stone table between the figures. Both humans are monks who have drunk the potion of dreadful sleep and have been in suspended animation for thousands of years. Either can be awoken from their slumber, but neither of them would want that. On the walls of the red boxed long hall is a series of drawings depicting people playing a game that uses a ball and has goals on either end of the playing field. There is a pit at the eastern end of this hall, filled with cursed treasure. Taking any of the treasure will commence a bloody game the module calls Pelota, where a football-sized ball, for Americans that is a soccer-sized ball, made of hard rubber will animate 
and move on its own accord. This room is decorated in a cat motif. An entire wall is carved to resemble the snarling face of a hollow-eyed jaguar. In the center of the room is a stuffed tiger posed as if on the prowl. In the middle of the room stands a statue of a jaguar-headed man holding a spear. The statue is actually a petrified were-jaguar. If the room's contents are abused, the were-jaguar will come alive and attack the offending party. The Great Wheel of Stone is actually a calendar carved from limestone. The calendar is mounted on the wall above a stone altar. On the altar rests a ceremonial dagger of flint and a jade statue of a cat. There is a secret door here that can be opened by pushing on the sun carving in the middle of the calendar. A pillared landing overlooks a great chamber that holds a gigantic model of the Tamoachen city during its peak. In the center of this model, three rivers meet to form a lake. On top of that lake is a tarnished copper ship crafted to resemble a dragon bearing a human-sized copper coffin. The first person to cross the landing and pillars will activate a wall of fire that will separate him or her from the rest of the party. A doppelganger will come out of the copper coffin and try to kill the player character trapped on its side of the wall of fire, then shape change into that character and then stuff the body into the copper coffin. Basically, the doppelganger is trying to take the character's place. This corridor leads towards a set of double bronze doors bearing the engraved face of a jaguar deity. Both walls of the corridor are carved to resemble two lines of warriors in profile painted in vivid colors holding hatchet-headed pole arms. At the midpoint of this corridor is a pressure plate which will trigger two of the carved warriors to pivot out from the walls in front of the player characters crossing their metal halibirds to block the way to the double doors. The halibirds are electrified and require a saving throw for those who are human sized or larger trying to pass by them. The chambers beyond the double doors are macabre and ghastly. Flayed human skins are tacked on the wall opposite the double doors, forming a gruesome tapestry. Skulls, bones, and broken weapons can be found on the floor. The air smells of barbecue. These are the chambers of Zipe. Zipe is an Oni, also known as an Ogre Mage. He has a taste for barbecued humanoid meat. Zipe has a panther as a pet. Given how much emphasis the module places on jaguars, I find it surprising that there are no jaguars to be encountered within. In the center of this room is a withered tree that looks like a leafless willow tree rooted in a terraced depression. The bottom of this hollow is filled with oily water. The leafless withered tree is actually a polyp, which is equivalent to a roper. Finally, we're getting to the upper tiers of the shrine. The stairs that lead to the second tier of the shrine are wet and slippery. Going up the stairs will trigger what appears to be a dragon that breathes steam at the top of the stairway. In reality, the dragon is a stone statue, and all it can do is breathe scalding steam on those in the stairway. 
the steam does relatively minor damage. As a dungeon master, I would adjust this damage in accordance to the player character's overall health. If they are at or near their maximum hit points, then I would have the steam deal a lot more damage. Just to keep the deception going of tricking the player characters into thinking and believing this is a real dragon that they are facing. A mirror on the wall. <laughs> mirror, mirror on the wall. Okay. There is a mirror on the wall at the end of this corridor. Anyone looking into the mirror must make a saving throw. Those who do not will be fighting an opponent in their mind. To others, the character is paralyzed and endlessly staring into the mirror. A lumpy pile of earthly material is in the middle of the floor of this room. The lumpy pile of earth is actually a gibbering mouther which is a new monster to the world of Dungeons and & Dragons and made its debut in this module. In the middle of this chamber is what appears to be a withered, preserved form of a centaur on top of a slab of marble. The figure is decked out in leather and adorned with feathers and copper jewelry. The room glitters with golden nuggets and colorful stones scattered around the floor. The figure is actually a mummy and a centaur at the same time. Basically a centaur mummy. Its purpose is not to allow any living creature from entering into the shrine's lower levels. At the same time, its purpose is not to allow any creature coming from the lower levels to leave the shrine. In this room is the chalky form of a statue seated on a stone throne. The statue is wearing a feathered headdress. Lying across its lap is a scepter of gold and silver. This statue is a chaotic evil Nawal, an alter ego being. It will duplicate the face and gender of the person who enters the room. Only this person will be able to remove the scepter from the Nawa's grasp. If that person does so and keeps a hold of the scepter, then he or she will be petrified and the Nawa will be unpetrified. This process takes 30 seconds. If this process reaches its conclusion, then the Nawa will have the memories of the petrified character and it will try to convince the other party members that it is him or her and that it just merged with the spirit of one of its earlier incarnations. On top of the ziggurat is the ruined temple of Zatzil Aha the vampire bat god of the underworld. The stone altar is carved to resemble a mass of squirming rats, weasels, and worms. Well, that concludes our tour of the C1 module, the hidden shrine of Tamawachan. Towards the end of this video, while the end song is playing, I will display some monsters and items along with their locations that I have not yet discussed or displayed earlier in this video. This module introduces the Nairid and the Gibbering Mouther into the world of D&D. Nairids are sea nymphs. They are from the elemental plane of water. On the material plane, their usual habitat are the oceans and seas. As dryads are bound to their trees, nairids are bound to their shawls. Usually they will have an aquatic creature as their pet. The gibbering mouther is an amoeboid-like life form, composed of all mouths and eyes. Its favorite attack tactic 
is to lie in wait with its eyes and mouths shut and appearing to be a lump sum of earthy material. Due to its excessive hunger, its lair and the surrounding area will be stripped bare. The drawings, maps, and art of the module were done by Errol Ottos, Jeff D., Gregory K. Fleming, David S. LaForce, David C. Sutherland III, and a couple of uncredited pieces by Darlene Peckle. Most of the module's art have already been displayed in this review. For the art and drawings that I have not yet displayed, I will do so towards the end of this video. Roll credits? Displayed are the credits found within the module itself. The C1 module received nearly great ratings on both Amazon's and DriveThruRPG's websites averaging a 4.4 out of 5 stars between the both of them. In the reviews, many of the praises for the module were for its unique Mayan and Aztec theme setting. Thank you for watching. Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. For those who have a, let's say, an unusual curiosity, I will keep my original walkthrough of the C1 module video up on YouTube for a few days before deleting it. Hopefully those who compare the two videos will hear a noticeable improvement. Likewise, I plan on improving my narrator voiceover of some of my past videos and likewise replace them. In terms of the YouTube algorithm, this is definitely going to hurt. Please like, subscribe, share, and comment. I do love feedback. Till next time, this is RPG Mods Fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye. Thank you.